thank you for the gracious introduction. Um, as Casey said, we're going to go through Bash today, some of the basics. Um, I'm going to go through a brief history of Bash. Uh, when I want to say brief, I mean pretty brief. It's like five slides, but uh, it should be at least enough to provide context for how Bash came about, how Bash is different from you know, the born shell. Bash stands for the born again shell. Uh, it's a little pun. Um, and then we'll go into some examples in the workshop and hopefully work through in parallel together just through some basic stuff. Um, I'm assuming that essentially you walk in here with almost no Bash knowledge. If you are walking in, bath in with Bash knowledge, feel free to contribute uh, any information you see as valuable. Um, there should be a little something for everyone in here. Uh, it's mostly the workshop is going to be mostly nifty tricks you can do with uh, Bash. Uh, stuff that I found useful in my research and stuff that I found useful in general organization of the file system. Um, okay, so the first thing to do, um, does everyone have an Agave account? No. Or no? I have no. Saguaro. You have Saguaro? Saguaro. Yeah. If you have Saguaro, you should have Agave, is that correct? I think, think so. Now. So if everyone could try right now logging into Agave, mm -hmm. they have their laptop. If not, if you don't have a machine, yes, yes. don't worry about it. But, um, can you use Uh, it should work. Yeah, you can get clumps up there as well. Just the the only reason I'm having people, I guess no one has a Mac, so it probably shouldn't be a problem. But, um, there are some slight differences in available options on the Mac, and some of the syntax doesn't quite print the same stuff. Uh, so, for example, the the dash t flag and copy. Um, on the Mac for whatever reason doesn't exist, so you can't specify the target directory first. You have to give a source and then target, which is really annoying. First things first, we go through this brief history. Um, so the predecessor, the original thing that came before both the born shell and the born again shell was the Thompson shell, sort of the most basic first Unix shells. It came out in 1971. It's developed by Ken Thompson, that's the name Thompson shell. Um, and it's basically just an interpreter, no real scripting setup for it. Um, so very bare bones. Um, we introduced some keynote features um, such as IO redirection, and this led to modern piping syntax. So originally, the syntax actually ended up being kind of confusing. So you would be like you know, command one, and if you wanted to pass the output from command one, you do a caret or a uh, greater than sign, and then maybe file name or something like that. All right, sorry, command two. And you would just use this greater than equal sign to also write to file names. So it's a little confusing. They didn't differentiate between when you were passing an output from one command to another versus passing an, the output to a file and writing to a file. Um, so this eventually led to what's called piping, which we'll get to in a moment. Um, and it has a little bit of a nicer uh, look to it. If you want to go from command to command, then you use this, this bar, and then same thing, greater than sign, you go to a file. Mm -hmm. right, so that was a big helpful thing uh, that was provided by the Thompson shell. Um, and eventually, I think after some updates, piping actually shows up in the, the Thompson shell in a later iteration called the Mashi shell. Okay, so the Mashi shell introduces some basic variable usage, um, and it incorporates I think, piping at, at a certain level. Um, this is then superseded by the Born shell. So this is the de default shell for version 7 of Unix. Um, it was developed by Stephen Born at Bell Labs. Um, and he basically it was almost immediately after the, the, the Mashi shell came out that he very quickly afterwards he put this up there. 
Um, and it acts as both an interpreter and a basic scripting language. So the first and most important thing about the Born Shell is that it allows scripting, as opposed to just dealing with the interpreter. Okay, then comes the Born Again Shell. All right. So this is the free replacement of the Born Shell. It was released as part of the GNU project, which GNU stands for GNU, not Unix, so it's a recursive definition, kind of silly. Um, but it came out in 1989. Brian Fox is the creator. Um, so it serves as the default shell for a bunch of Linux distributions and Mac OS, and it's showing up in, I think, Windows 10 as well, and all these places. So it's by far one of the most popular um, shells for it. Um, it. The syntax was extended. Uh, there was an increase in interactivity, a good example being like line completion, tab completion, when you're, when you're going through. Um, so this was added in 89. Very convenient. I don't know if anyone who's used Bash before knows that tab complete is just like, I'm, I'm using tab complete every time that I'm doing something, so I don't have to type that. Okay, so definitely the most popular. Um, some of the strengths and weaknesses. Strengths, um, a lot can be accomplished with just one line. So this is, I think this is really at the heart of what, what makes Bash valuable, is that with a single line you can accomplish quite a bit, in large part because of this piping. You can just keep stringing these commands together and then write whatever the final output is to file. So I think of uh, Bash is a little bit like a preprocessing. Like if you're if you're like a line cook or something, this is you use Bash to like chop up all the veggies and get them ready to be cooked, right? And then cooking you do in something like Python or Mathematica. But really getting the data into the format that you want it to be and looking as clean as possible makes it you know so much easier once you pull it into Python. Um, okay, so what else? It's fundamental to file system organization. Knowing it's really important if you want to sort of rapidly prototype. Uh, what the file system is going to look like for like running simulations, where you're going to store the data, where you're going to store all the, the prerequisite input files and, and run files, and so on. You you want to be able to be fluent enough in Bash that you can set up a good organization relatively quickly without having to think too much about what you're doing. Um, it has a lot a large set of straightforward and useful commands built in, so that facilitates all that. And when you couple that with the piping, it really just uh, makes it a, a breeze. Um, so you can I end up improvising most of my scripts and commands in Bash, and then after I do them, after I get them to work, uh, and I iterate through you know, all my different attempts, once I get something working, then I, I slide it into a, a script. Once I have the script, it's like a nice little button. And just from then on, I have the shell scripts, and I can press go and never have to worry about it again. Uh, okay, so some of the weaknesses though, it's limited functionality versus Python, so if you're gonna do more complicated data analysis, probably not gonna come out so great. Uh, or it's going to just take an eternity to, to write out. Um, plotting, not nearly as easy or beautiful as in Python and so on. Um, larger scripts in Bash become harder to sort of maintain, they're harder to read, um, they're not as easy to implement. Uh, so maintaining this kind of code base is significantly more difficult than using Python. That's why I would basically recommend using it just for these little convenient things prior to the real meat of your analysis. Okay, so that's that's the brief history. Now we're gonna get to the workshop. Uh, you guys walked in late, right? Yes. So we have the the Git clone line over here that you can use. Uh, I recommend signing into Agave if you have an account. Um, yeah, and you both have Mac, so if you don't sign into Agave, you might want to go some problems today. Here. So has everyone um, get cloned the repository together? Except for these, these two guys. Yeah, okay. All right, so I'm gonna go to my... input directory, stru structural files, and topologies, right? So this is based on the kind of scenario that I've run into in my research. I have a number of files, or directories, that contain files that I want. Say that I want to put together a test directory, right? But I want to, in one line, copy each of the files that I need from these separate directories into the test directory. 
So the easiest way to do that uh, is using something called the XR. So does anyone have a, a suggestion on how they would go about doing this? You have three different places you want to copy from, and then anyone who has batch experience, um, you want to copy to a single directory. How, how would you do it? Would you loop? Would you? Is there something? Do you? Does anything occur to you in terms of how to accomplish this? Anybody? No. You could put the paths for each file in each uh, directory. Just tell them to copy to uh, test. Say again. So if there's a file. If there's a file in input, you could do input file one space struct file two space then give it a location and it'll copy all of them into there. Yeah, should do that. Yeah. Um, if you have, uh, that's right, you could give file paths, you can also do, um, XRX is quite nice for this. Um, <coughs> if, well, I guess the file works just fine. Mm -hmm. that's what's easy. But what I would do immediately is imp, I would pick out, okay, that's my input file, struct, uh, pull up the last frame, okay, uh, that's apology, pull up the apology that I want, Luck. And you can just pipe this to what's called XArts. Um, so XArts is going to take and read, I'm echoing these three different things, right? these two different file paths, essentially. Um, and it's going to take one file path at a time and copy them over. Right? Um, so the syntax then is. So it's important to notice that XRX here, it's going to take these one at a time and sort of add them to the end of the line. It's going to feed it the argument at the end. So this is just, I wanted to give an example of how to use this because it can be quite useful when you're typing and you need to sort of iterate through something but you don't want to do necessarily a loop. Um, okay, so the T just designates the target uh, directory. And then if you can imagine each one of these things being echoed gets added to the end, you're going to repeat the line. And then you can see Everything's copied over. Okay, and so then, like Ian Kenny said, there's also a simpler version where you would just say, um, did it move them? That and then say put it all in test. And do um, XARGs seems superfluous here. Go ahead. So if you want to see what XARGs does, if you, you just put an echo in front of your copy command, you just go back to your line with XARGs. Okay. Yeah. Then put an echo after the one and in front of this copy. Okay. And then just hit enter. You can see exactly what XRX is going to do. So if I've set this up properly, um, that's a nice introduction to just the basic uh, copying multiple things. Okay. Uh, the let's see, actually, don't get XRX about that. Well, um, this is going to be a more sophisticated example. I have extra directories here that I've already set up. To get to where I am here, just do make dir, and then this is quite neat in bash. Um, if you're on a Mac, it won't work in the same way. But if you type this out, this, the curly brackets here, dot, 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 basically you can imag imagine expanding this into a series of um, different strings. Right? Those strings are going to be 001, 002, 003. Uh, but this, this represents sort of the well packaged version of that. So you don't have to type out nearly as much. Albert? Yeah, it almost works in my Mac. It doesn't make it with the leading zero. Right, so that's that's why I said SSH into Agave, because for whatever reason Mac uh, the, they just it gets rid of the leading zeros and so you will end up getting sort of uglier looking directories. It still works ish, but if if you want to actually have the leading zeros you have to do something else to specify it on a Mac. But anyway, so we get this start it already exists, right? On yours, it should write them. Um, okay, so now, suppose that I have this template, right? This is what I want every single one of those things to look like. 
um, in principle, I could just copy all of what's in here in a loop, right? So do I'll do that first. So for i in all right, so this is sort of the most straightforward approach. Um, then the syntax is do, right? Uh, and the way that you close out the loop is with a done. But so actually we'll do copy templates. All the contents of the template. So the asterisk stands it's a wildcard and it sort of sponges up all the contents of the template. What's up? Uh, you're in template. Oh shoot. Thank <laughs> case it's the, uh, the loop variable is going to be the actual name of the directory. So you can copy just in the loop variable and get it done. And oh, I didn't do it recursively, sorry, I'll do it again. Why do you need the brackets on the i? Um, in principle, I don't think you need them for this instance, but it's safer to use the brackets. Um, there are other instances where they're important. Uh, so if you're writing a string, for instance, and you want to append some string at the end, if you keep the brackets, then you can not have a space in between. Gotcha. So, separates it out. Okay, now obviously my first mess up is I didn't recursively copy. Um, if you are copying directories, you need to have this dash r flag. Otherwise, you're just not gonna, it's, it's gonna ignore the directory. Um, okay, so copies through. Where can I get information about the CP command if I need it? So, beautifully, uh, built into this interpreter is this, uh, it's not really a command, but it's something called man. So you can go man and then any command. So in this case, man cp. And it'll pull up the manual. So, so manual is straight up exactly what it sounds like. It gives you the name, gives you a good description, gives you a layout for all the different parameters you can use, um, all the different options. And they're quite extensive. So if you, if you run into problems, um, the first place to go to is always, always, always the man page. Um, you can also additionally do things like cp dash dash help. Um, sometimes documentation is different between help and man. Uh, does if, if you ever run into trouble, it should be your first um, first instinct is to hit the man page. Okay. Okay. So. That's just the basic file system organization slash copying things. Uh, nothing too exciting so far. But let's get into the data processing stuff. So let's go to temperature regulation. Um, this is going to be a little more dicey, so I'm going to go a little bit slower through it. So what I did here is I decided, OK, what's a, what's a good scenario where I could use bash to process data? Um, and I got curious about my laptop. My laptop is kind of old. It's been heating up a little bit too much. I wanted to take a look at how it's doing in terms of temperature regulation. So I have this thing called iStats that I downloaded for the Mac. Not necessarily important here. I have a log file from that. So that's what we're going to be using today. Essentially, iStats is going to print out a bunch of information about, you know, from the various different sensors that are my Mac. So let's look at compi.stats1. Okay, so you can see we have battery temperature up top, CPU temperature, fan speed. Battery health is pretty poor. <laughs> Uh, like I said, it's an old old laptop. Got to get it replaced. Um, so this is all information, and I had I had iStats run uh, in a loop, basically ran for a day, and it pauses for one second after the iteration. So it's basically every second I'm picking up um, this information. Okay, so then I printed it as file. That's all I did. I just I can actually show you the loop. It's in day stats. Okay, quite simple, standard bash for loop. So use iStats here. Uh, no graphs because it spits out this, this bar graph, various different colors, telling you sort of in what condition your machine is. Mine is not in great shape, but uh, then notice here, instead of doing the single greater than sign, which is a cat, I use a double. Double means append, so it's going to instead of writing over the file that already already exists, it'll just add all the information to the end. All right, so then sleep one just means sleep for one second. Mm -hmm. Any questions on living? I forget that's pretty straightforward. Okay. Uh, so looking back at 
company. Suppose that we wanted to get just the CPU temperature. So the easiest way to do this is using something called prep. prep. So it searches through some input file for a unique string that you've um, fed. And so any line that contains that string, it will print back out to standard out for you. So we can leverage this to find the data that we're interested in. So we'll say grep CPU. the string that you're looking for, the file that you're searching, and this will then print out all the instances of CPU temp. And this is you know, a little messy, but it's organized into columns, not too bad. Because the next step is what? We want to get at these values here, right? So we want to ignore everything else. Um, we go back to our grep. Pipe the, whoops, pipe the output. It's using the, the vertical bar. It's going to send the output that we see here printed to the screen to the next command, which in this case is going to be awk. The syntax is a little funny, but bear with me. Okay, so what's going on here with awk is awk is going to be parsing through for the column of my choice. And so you see the, you have the, the quotes, you have print, you have installer sign three. This three indicates that which column you're going to be printing okay, from the data. Um, as far as what's going on underneath the hood with this, I'm not overly um, educated on that, so I would look the man page, look through any resources on your own if you're really interested in the nuts and bolts of how any of these commands are working. Um, but as far as functional usage goes, um, you take this format and it'll it'll give you out the column. So let's go ahead and confirm that that's what it's doing. All right, good. Gives us all the temperatures. Now we have a bit of a problem. So they're not very good with their level of precision here. Um, they have three decimal places here, or sorry, one decimal place with you know, three digits, um, two decimal places here. Uh, so if I did something like cut, you can use cut to say cut the first five characters in the string. That's not going to be helpful here because it varies in length. But we don't like what the last two characters are in each of these strings. So even though they're varying in length somewhat, we can sort of chop off the last two characters if we're careful. So you can use something called set. There's actually, this is a beautiful thing about Bash, there's about 100 million ways to do any given thing. Um, you can use set here, you can use awk, um, you can use loops uh, over, I think, a file. It's pretty crazy. I saw a bunch of different solutions of looking for this. But the one that I like using is set. So first, let's do, what does awk look like? Kind of record scanning and processing language. Okay. So how is set different than awk? It's going to just edit what's coming through the oh, right. um, okay, So, Okay, so using set, you get a similar type of uh, syntax. Where's my shit? Again, I, I'm not entirely aware of what's going on with the bolts. If anyone here is, you can with me. Uh, feel free to, to throw that into the conversation. But functionally, all you need to know is that said is the main command, right? And then you look at what's in the quotes. It's sort of wrapped by this S forward slash and this dollar sign uh, forward slash forward slash. Those I'm treating as essentially parentheses in my head. And then internally here, these dots tell you how many symbols to remove from the end. So something about the S and the dollar sign is telling you move to the end of the string. <laughs> And then the, the dots are telling you, pull off the last two symbols. OK, so does it work as we expect? It does, indeed. So now we have pure temperature. And we can write this to a file called CPU temps. Uh, it's in Celsius, so we want to remind ourselves that it's in Celsius. We'll put it to a text file. So now we have this nice text file below our data. Okay, so we go through a similar process 
um, for fan speed and um, battery control. So I've written this out into this script. So instead of doing this manually now, I've taken my first attempt of just sort of improvising my way through the lines, saying, OK, well, how is the output change as I stack these different lines together? And now I can just basically replicate the same kind of thing, but with the other um, quantities of interest that I'm searching for in the data. And the idea of this is if I'm collecting data in real time, the extraction happens faster than the rate of collection. So I will be extracting the data from the log file, even if it's being written to, pretty much all at the same time. Um, so that when I do analysis, I can do analysis in real time as my computer is collecting data. Uh, OK, so then another nice little thing that you can do is set variables. Since the log file is the same for all these three different commands, uh, I just say log equals the name of my log file, and then I can use that variable later on with a dollar sign before it. Okay. Any questions so far? Moving too fast, not fast enough. Cool. Right, good. Uh, okay, so now to run that file, quite easy. We just do doc extract.sh. And this should give us a bunch of different text files. Now we have our battery temps, we have our CPU temps that was before, and our fan RPMs. Okay, so now we have all the data we want. Oh, so mm -hmm. a note about the dot. That's the same thing as sourcing. So you'll actually keep the log environment variable in your current environment. So if you uh, ran it with bash extract.sh, then you wouldn't have access to that log variable. Um, I guess what I'm saying is when you do the dot, you're actually changing something in your environment. Oh, I see. Yeah. I see, I see. So, so I, I would be able to echo log right now. Yeah, so if you change something that's really important Fair in enough. your script, it, it will stay that way. So it's safer so. to use bash and yeah. then extract. Uh, or do a, yeah. yeah. So, well, good enough because I've been using the dot yeah. for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so now that we have all our data together, I just want to give an example of how easy it is here, did I? Yeah. So I, I SSH in with a, a special option. Um, if you guys want to see that, I can, I can move from that in a second. But it's going to let me port for remote correctly. Oh, Jupiter's not installed on Agave. OK, never mind. Never mind. What we're going to do is go to. Workshop. Uh, I'm going to read git clone here. Apologies. Installed. That's quite unfortunate. Apologies, but if you just follow along here, this is Python, so it's not necessarily the most important part of the workshop. Um, but I can, I can at least show you now sort of how simple it is once I get into Python. I'm just importing all the stuff that I'm going to use. This is where I suck in the data. Simple as that. Maybe I do a little bit of tweaking so I rescale the data. Um, calculate some averages over here. I'm going to plot those horizontal lines. And this is all just plotting. So as far as actual cleaning up of the data, I haven't had to do anything. I just, I just sucked it in, and it's almost immediately useful. Um, and I can give you interesting output now here. So this plot, a little small. So the dark red on the top, the brick red is the CPU temperature in Celsius on the left. Uh, on the bottom, we have the battery temperature. The means are plotted with these um, dot dash lines. Um, obviously, this is the battery mean, this is the CPU mean, and then we have the fan uh, speed in terms of RPM in the blue dash line here. Um, so you can see that you know the temperature went up a little bit around this time point, and I've zeroed in on a specific aspect of the data. But you can see that the temperature went up, and there's a short delay, and then the tank of the fan clicks on. That took almost no work to actually generate these plots. You know what I mean? It, yeah, something can be done. The plotting code maybe if you've already have it lying around in Python, copy and paste, move it over. It took me maybe 15 minutes to put that together. And then as far as sucking the data out and processing it, we just did it now in you know, less than 10 minutes. Right? Um, so that should be somewhat compelling. 
And then obviously you can, you can continue on to do more sophisticated analysis with you know, whatever, whatever approach you want to use. All right, any questions, comments, concerns? Jokes, riddles, okay. Um, now we're gonna go to WGET. This is gonna be somewhat similar to the previous um, in that we're gonna use something, grab an output file from it, and see what it looks like and, and see what we can pull from it. Um, but what's more important here is that WGET is, a, is actually a fairly useful tool, and I didn't actually start using it until you know past six months, basically, but it's been quite useful. Um, it's basically just download this and then give it a link. And it, the link is to whatever the download source is, you download that file to wherever you are in the file system, and it gives you a nice little output for the progress bar. So you can do something like, uh, I've included in the readme here, by the way, a link to the video that I'm going to do the WGET on. So if you want to go back through at any point, or if you want to look into it now, you can go ahead and grab the Vimeo link. The reason I didn't put the download link is uh, they refresh the download link every few minutes. Uh, so if I put it in there, it just won't work after a couple minutes. So this, I chose this Vimeo uh, video because it's high quality, about nine minutes. And it'll take a couple minutes to download. You can sort of see what the progress bar is it's doing, what the app looks like. Um, so I can have it running in the background. Okay, so we're here. Get. So this is sort of just the standard way to use them. You get, you put the download link into the quotations. Right. And you run it, and you get a nice little progress bar going pretty quick, right? Gives you an estimate of how long it takes. Wow, that went super fast. How long it takes, <laughs> uh, and then the, the rate at which you're downloading something, and then the total amount downloaded over time. So I ask the question, how do I get this to a file? How do I print this to a file if I'm running the command? Well, it's not going to be particularly easy. Something funky is going on. They're using both standard out and standard error simultaneously. Sort of in a way that's that I'm not actually fully privy to. Um, so trying to manually unpack the output um, looks kind of gross. So for example, if I do this, you run it again. I go t um, test dot. Uh, no, I think that the log will end up looking kind of gross. This looks fine. If I remember correctly, ah, doesn't even write to use t. Okay, so try it again instead of using t. I will, sorry, didn't explain T. T is, allows you to view the standard output as you're writing into a file. Um, so in this case, it wasn't sending anything to standard output. Uh, but if I do this, try to write something to test.log, I think it ends up looking like nonsense. I also did it on a Mac, I don't know if it's even worse on there, but nope, okay, just not writing anything out. Okay, so we're, we're sort of failing something. But luckily, with programs like this, they usually build something in to help you out. So let's go through the wget again. And this time we can do this little option. And then we say test up So OK, so now they're going to give us the output that they've formatted beforehand in test up It's not going to look exactly the same as the progress bar, but it'll do the job. Um, this kind of thing that you know, looking at the man page is vital because of this. If you find yourself trying to just struggle to, to get something to work, you know, normally you can get something's output to go straight to a file or straight to you and use T to look at it as, it, as it's coming out. It's going to be the same thing you see in your log file. If you run into problems, look at the man page, look at the options that are available. A lot of times you'll see if it's tricky like this, they will, they will, they will have already solved the problem for you. So you don't, you don't need to reinvent the wheel most of the time. It's best to, to look for um, where the solution works is. Okay, so look at the test log. Did not write it. Oh, yeah, okay, good. Um, okay, so this is what it, the output is. Not too bad. Um, to analyze it now, we go, go through the exact same process we did before. Uh, you would grep for some unique string. In my case, I chose k space dot 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 dot. Uh, it was just helpful because there are other regions where if, if the download interrupts at some point, wget will pause and then attempt to restart the download at the point where it failed. 
Um, so you'll get these chunks of text telling you about the errors and so on. And some of them include like long ellipses like this. So it's absolutely vital that when you use grep and these other things, that you're choosing a truly unique string that only lines up with the data that you're interested in. Okay. So then you can already imagine how the exact same thing that we've already done, perfectly applicable to this. Um, in fact, I've written a little shell script here. You can see the reason I call it RT instability is that's what the video video's on. Um, you can put in these nice echo lines that tell you as you're doing the extraction which step of the extraction is occurring. You can see that I use this unique string here, k space. Da, 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 da. Uh, using the log variable again, um, so on. Nothing new here. Ox the same, set is the same. Um, and then you can just do the same kind of thing if you wanted to analyze uh, how, for example, wget is approximating how much time is remaining, given that you have this fluctuating download speed. You could essentially reverse engineer that with this data. Right? Um, and again, as simple as just saying, output the stuff, grab a couple times, off a couple times, set a couple times, and you're good to go. Uh, so I don't I don't think you can that one. Allow your imaginations to take hold. But um, that about covers any of the examples. So if anyone has questions or wants to see another instantiation of some some code, um, any questions would be appreciated. I have a comment on wget. If you use dash capital O, you can write it to a file name that doesn't look as ugly as these things. The, oh, I see. Uh, the download itself will actually be. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know what kind of suffix you're supposed to give it because I can't see it from there. These are dot .avis or dot .mp4. So MP4, yeah. But then you can say dash capital O instability dot .mp4. Let's, let's remove those. Okay, you said big O. Mm -hmm. Big O, and I would say what RT uh, stability dot mp4. Mm -hmm. Nice. We'll get an well, that was a little bit fast. That was a little bit fast. I'm a little worried about that. Uh, oh, you yeah. meant the, the link diet, yeah. yeah. That's what I'm talking about. say with the, uh, you can take the standard, so that's actually spitting out on standard error um, without any of the other options. Um, you can actually just do a two greater than and then the file name, and that'll redirect uh, standard error into the file. The first one that I attempted, let's do it. Let's do it live. Do it live. Um, so you're saying, I should do that. I'll get rid of the O entirely. Uh, I'm going to do this for writing the file name, so it's like, but then you say to yeah space and then the file and just to re that redirect standard error I mean it's going to look like junk but I was, was going to say I think that this is what ends up being nonsense because I tried to yeah. mess around with this as well yeah. um, some of this redirection is non true nope that's fine thing that, so you mentioned with grep and set, you can give these patterns there, and technically they are regular expressions which are complicated. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want to know more, man, re, I think. Okay. Let's try lowercase. Uh, mm, it's not the pitch. <laughs> Um, 
Reg X. Reg X. The difference between a regular expression and a string being that you have sort of special characters that mean things. So, for instance, a dot means just anything, any any character. Gotcha. Um, okay. Dollar means at the end of the string, for instance. So the the pattern that you had dot dot dollar means match match the last two characters at the end of the string and then replace it with nothing. Gotcha. Okay. But there are very sort of depending, you know, set and awk might do one thing, then Perl does something slightly different thing, Python again does something slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, I would definitely stress that it's a, you gotta get comfortable with whatever ends up being a solution that seems intuitive to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.